There can be few names in fashion that are as immediately recognisable as Yves Saint Laurent. His meteoric rise to become head designer of Christian Dior at the scarcely believable age of 21 is the stuff of dreams. But three years later, while languishing in a military hospital, he was unceremoniously dumped by Dior, and he had to pick himself up and start all over again. He openly spoke of having to battle his mental health demons throughout his life, and coming through to reach the heavens of creativity. But was there another side to this complex personality, a darker side that he hid from the world? Welcome to Insane History. I'm Professor Graham Yorston, and today I'm at the Yves Saint Laurent Museum in Marrakech in Morocco, exploring the life and struggles of a legend of the fashion industry. This award-winning museum, set in beautiful gardens, opened in 2017, and focuses on his life and relationship with Morocco, a country he always returned to, to retreat from the pressure of his work. He discovered the neglected Majorelle Gardens in Marrakesh in the 1980s and spent the rest of his life restoring them. And it is here that he chose to have his ashes scattered after his death. But let's start at the beginning. Yves Saint Laurent was born in 1936 in Oran in Algeria. The city was no colonial backwater as Algeria was officially a département of France at the time and in the major towns, Europeans formed the majority of the population. His family lived on the ground floor of this house, recently restored and now also a museum. His father was the head of an insurance company and director of a cinema chain. His mother socialised with the wide circle of friends and discussed the latest fashions over tea, with her son excitedly listening in. From a young age, Yves showed a talent for drawing. He made his own illustrated books, and inspired by touring theatrical groups, he created his own cardboard stage and made the costumes for his actors from his mother's dresses. School, however, he was less keen on. He was shy, quiet, awkward. He was perceived as different. He had no friends and stayed in the bathroom during breaks. In free periods, he would lean against the windows of the chapel, alone. Lanky and unsporty, his schoolmates bullied him mercilessly, which made him even more nervous and understandably reluctant to go back for more. He complained of feeling ill every day to try and avoid the humiliation and continual reminders that he did not belong, and escape into a world where he felt he did. Fortunately, home life was different. His mother doted on him, and when his two younger sisters came along, he began designing dresses for them, and for his mother, and he announced that this was what he wanted to do with his life. His parents were supportive, and in 1953, with the help of his father's contacts, he met Michel de Brunhoff, editor-in-chief of French Vogue, who encouraged him to finish his education. A year later, at the age of 18, he moved to Paris to study at the prestigious fashion school, the École de la Chambre Syndicale de la Haute Couture, and entered every competition he could, notably beating a young German who would become his long-term rival, Karl Lagerfeld. In June 1955, after less than a year, Saint Laurent met with de Brunhoff again and showed him 50 of his sketches. De Brunhoff was struck by the young man's talent and the resemblance between his drawings and Christian Dior's A-line designs, which had not yet been revealed to the world. He arranged for Saint Laurent to meet Dior, who immediately hired him to work in his studio. In his first year, he was given rather mundane tasks, but Dior announced him as his successor in 1957, and when Dior died unexpectedly later the same year of a heart attack, the 21-year-old Yves Saint Laurent was elevated into the position of head designer of one of Paris's major fashion houses. An unbelievable opportunity, but immense pressure on very young shoulders. 
Saint Laurent's first collection as the head of Dior in spring 1958, the Trapeze Line, was an outstanding success, gaining him international attention and putting the House of Dior on a sounder financial footing. His next collection, just a few months later however, was less well received, and his later designs at Dior, including hobble skirts and his first forays into the beatnik look, were also met with savage criticism. In early 1960, Saint Laurent was notified that he was going to be called up to serve in the French army. The Algerian War of Independence had been heating up for several years, and the government was keen to hang on to a territory it regarded as part of France, at all costs. Public opinion was not sympathetic to anyone perceived as trying to avoid the call-up. And although Marcel Boussac, the owner of the House of Dior, had helped Saint Laurent avoid conscription in 1958 and 59, he was unwilling to do so again. It may have been because of a genuine desire to avoid bad publicity, but it was speculated that after Saint Laurent's disastrous recent form, Boussac was only too happy to use his two-year stint in the army as an excuse to get rid of him. As the date at which he was due to report to the barracks got closer, Saint Laurent became more and more despondent. The newspapers were full of stories about the squalid conditions for new recruits, and he was terrified it was going to be like being back at school, with the bullying starting all over again. The papers were also full of stories of people getting killed, with atrocities being committed by both sides. The result was that even before he pulled on his uniform for the first time, he was in a desperately fragile state. One can only imagine how the other recruits reacted to the sensitive, arty dress designer in their midst. And perhaps it is no surprise that he lasted only 20 days before being admitted to the Begin Military Hospital in Paris. There, he received the news that he'd been fired by Boussac as the head of Dior, and his condition deteriorated. So after two weeks, he was transferred to the Val de Grasse Military Psychiatric Hospital. In one biography, this is described as a 19th century house of horror, filthy and unheated and it was said that many of the doctors on the staff were only there because they were too poorly qualified to get jobs elsewhere, and the nurses little better. But this sounds to me like journalistic sensationalism. This is what the hospital and adjoining Abbey Church actually look like. And improving conditions have been a priority of mental health policy in France since the end of the Second World War. During the German occupation, over 40,000 patients had died of starvation in French psychiatric hospitals, and after the war, it was recognised that the system required modernisation. In 1957, the government earmarked 30% of the total health budget for psychiatry, and all of the innovations that had been introduced in mental health hospitals in the rest of the world were available in France. The good ones, and the not-so-good ones. The biggest innovation of them all, the breakthrough that transformed psychiatry and millions of patients worldwide, effective antipsychotic medication, was first used in France in 1952, at the very hospital Saint Laurent now found himself in. So Val de Grasse was at the cutting edge and most definitely not a backwater. The shock horror tone of the biography continues with statements that the hospital staff probably despised Saint Laurent and that after an attempt at escaping, he was pumped full of sedatives every morning and left alone day after day on a makeshift bed with soiled sheets, with other patients coming in and interfering with him. It is said he barely ate or drank for weeks and was subjected to mind-altering medication and electroshock therapy. This all sounds terrible, but as a psychiatrist, I would say that of course he would have been given medication, and if he did not improve, then of course the dose would have been increased. And if medication alone did not bring about a recovery, then of course electroconvulsive therapy would have been used. I know that many people think of shock treatment as little better than the lobotomies inflicted on patients in previous decades, but it is very different, and I have seen how ECT can be a real lifesaver for people with severe mental illness. After two months of treatment, 
Saint Laurent was well enough to be discharged from hospital. His weight had dropped to 80 pounds, less than 40 kilos. It was clear he was going to need more time to fully recover, and he was released from further army service. After a quick trip to see a lawyer about suing Dior for breach of contract, his partner Pierre Berger took him to convalesce in the Canary Islands. When the case went to court, he was awarded 680,000 francs, around one and a half million dollars today. Quite a lot of money, but not enough to start your own fashion house and go it alone. Berger quickly became an effective and bullish business partner and secured the extra funding to launch the company. The rest is history. The Saint Laurent brand has become one of the most popular and successful in the world, generating over $3 billion in worldwide revenue last year. Now, I can't claim to know anything about the fashion world, but those that do say that in the 1960s and 70s, Saint Laurent popularized the beatnik look. Safari jackets, thigh-length boots, Mondrian dresses, and the tuxedo suit for women. He is said to have been inspired by women's lives in the socio-political climate of the times, and to have been one of the first designers to introduce North African influences into haute couture. He's also credited with starting the shoulder pad look of the 1980s, and for democratizing the fashion world by introducing a ready-to-wear line. The company expanded into perfumes and cosmetics, famously launching its first male fragrance with Saint Laurent himself appearing naked in an advertisement. But despite all the success and acclaim, his mental health struggles continued. He always said his troubles started during his first hospitalisation in the army. But Berger went as far as saying that he was born depressed. Some have suggested he was bipolar. Others that he had an emotionally unstable personality disorder, complicated by substance misuse. Others that his lifelong social awkwardness was a sign of autism. But I don't think there is enough reliable information to pin down a diagnosis, as so much that has been written about him is conflicting and subject to bias. In the 1960s, he was part of the fashionable jet set dividing his time between Paris and New York, mixing with film stars and being seen at the trendiest clubs. On the surface, he was happy and confident, but this was a facade, maintained at least in part by alcohol and illicit substances. The real Saint Laurent behind the scenes was anxious, intensely private and racked with self-doubt and mood instability. Although most of his collections were warmly received, this was not guaranteed, and he was always worried that the critics could turn on him at any moment. In the 60s he said, So they have crowned me king. Look what happened to all the other kings in France. A few years later he pointed out that he had been under intense scrutiny from his early 20s. Life, he said, is to be lived when one is young, and truly I have never lived. The pressure and high state of arousal was exhausting for Saint Laurent himself and also for those around him. He had the reputation of being a difficult, needy personality and he split romantically from Berger in 1976, although Berger continued as his business partner. In her biography, Marie-Dominique Le Lièvre describes Saint Laurent in very unflattering terms, as a bully who would take out his own insecurities and self-loathing on those beneath him, a drunken tyrant who would throw things at people when angry, an athlete as far as ashtray throwing is concerned. She says he had no real friends, loved nobody and only used people. She describes how he would go out on the prowl to nightclubs looking for savage and hazardous adventures, ending up in hospital on more than one occasion. The book was dismissed as gossip by Berger, but Tom Ford, the designer and former creative director for the YSL brand, once described them both as difficult and evil. His complex personality is portrayed slightly differently in the two French language biopics that were released in 2014. One, Yves Saint Laurent, sometimes referred to as the authorized version, as it had access to Berger's diaries and archives, focuses on the earlier part of his career, while the other, Saint Laurent, 
claiming to be an unofficial but more truthful version of his life, covers a slightly later period. Neither film shies away from showing the seedier side of the designer's life, and he doesn't emerge from either as a particularly likeable person. Despite his mental health struggles, he remained incredibly productive, retreating to his neo-Gothic castle or his villa in Marrakesh when the pressure got too much. With Berger, he began filling his houses with art, amassing an enormous collection that was sold for over $400 million after his death, much of which was donated to an AIDS research foundation. As a designer, he was often considered the head of his time, challenging accepted norms and pushing boundaries in terms of class, gender and sexuality. He linked his desire to empower women through fashion to his own struggles with societal expectations and prejudice. As his fame grew, so did the pressures and demands of the fashion industry, and his mental health suffered. In the late 1980s, his bouts of depression became more frequent and severe, and his substance misuse escalated. He looked unwell, and he had difficulty walking. A media interest in his health grew so intense that Berger had to issue statements denying that he was suffering from AIDS. Declining company profits led to YSL being sold in 1993. And although Saint Laurent continued as head of the Couture division, he seemed to have become more interested in collecting art for his apartment in Paris, his 1890s mini chateau in Normandy, and houses in Marrakesh. During a trip to Palermo in Sicily, he is said to have fallen and broken both arms. He never fully recovered and was no longer able to sketch a pastime and form of expression he had enjoyed since his earliest years. He retired from fashion in 2002 and spoke of his psychological journey. Every man needs aesthetic phantoms in order to exist. I have hunted mine out, pursued them, tracked them down. I have grappled with anguish and I have been through sheer hell. I have known fear and the terrors of solitude. I have known those fair-weather friends we call tranquilizers and drugs. I have known the prison of depression and the confinement of hospital. I did not choose this tragic descent, but through it I was able to rise to the heavens of creativity where I came across the firemakers that Rambo spoke of, discovering myself and understanding that the most important encounter in one's life is that with oneself. In his final years, he became increasingly reclusive, spending a lot of time in Morocco. In 2007, he was admitted to the American hospital in Paris with an undisclosed illness and passed away in June 2008 from brain cancer. The story of Yves Saint Laurent serves as a reminder of the all too close relationship between creativity and mental instability. His life can be seen as a testament to the resilience of the human spirit to the greatness that can emerge from the struggle just to keep going when everything seems bleak. Despite the significant challenges he faced, he revolutionised the fashion world, forever changing the way we think about design and style. His legacy lives on, an enduring symbol of the power of art to transform our deepest thoughts into something beautiful. At least, that's the standard version, and what I thought when I began researching this video. Another case of an artistic genius being sorely tested by the torments of bipolar disorder. That is the version his longtime partner Berger wanted the world to believe. But how much truth there is in this, or in the alternative bad boy version, is unclear. At the end of the day, biographers need to sell books, and businessmen need to sell an image, and we have to choose which version we buy. That's it for today. Thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up and uh, subscribe if you'd like to see more thought-provoking content. Otherwise, I'll see you again soon. Bye for now.